client-facing sales versus client-facing risk management. If you're not client-facing, we don't, we don't look at you. So risk management, raise your hand. And sales, raise your hand. OK, so more on the sales side. So and if you is, want it, is, it, is it vendor sales or? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, sorry. Uh, vendor sales versus uh, P&L sales. Vendor, vendor sales? OK, P&L sales? All right. OK, that's kind of mixed. So you know, I, um, I'm not going to speak. This is pretty much the last. But I asked them to submit some topics. And they sent me a, a very rich uh, feedback. So, but we, we can summarize these topics in three uh, main bullet, point, bullet points that uh, we will now enumerate. So um, as we will see, one is, uh, I would like you to, to remember these three words. One is consistency, one is transparency, and one is perspective. And what that means and how we can elaborate on them, uh, you know, let's uh, hear Mark and Jeff what they had to think about it. So let's maybe attack the first one. And who would like to start with, you know, consistency? What does that mean and why this word? Right. Want me to start? Consistency. Sh yeah, sure. Go for it. Um, uh, con so consistency. Uh, again, uh, we're from uh, the hedge fund world, and you have um, a strong personality running the firm, usually very bright, and has built a business over time that then has to be. The message has to be communicated to different stakeholders. Um, in order to um, reduce the, um, in order to, um, in order to increase the impact of the message before it goes out, to have a common lexicon of language, to dis to um, agree across treasury, portfolio, marketing, and risk, who says what, all that work should be, and ideally is done before the investor walks in the room. And it may sound like it is something that, um, of course, occurs. But in hedge funds, depending on how professionally they're run, it can be siloed. Um, there may not be a push to have someone in treasury um, overlap with someone in risk to deal with counterparty versus treasury risk. Um, so, so the most important part is to have an internal reference and a common lexicon in order to have the investor, when they ping each individual group, so they have a consistent message that's just a variation depending on who they're talking to. Yes, the marketing person says that we cut our teeth in credit and that liquidity is very important. Then the risk person says we spend 60% of our time on liquidity. And then the treasury person says we make sure that we have redundancy of counterparties so that we know we can trade. That, that's a consistent message. So um, that is number one about conceptually. And then the execution part um, is also something done before the investor or regulator walks in the room. Uh, and I'll hand it off to Jeff on that part, because first it's conceptual, and the execution has to do a lot with the transparency leg. Yeah. But I mean, just like back, yeah. Just, just so I want to say, so to remind you guys, if you guys have questions or you want to state your opinion on this subject, please, you know, it's a, we're a small audience. so. You know, please raise your hands. We would like to hear about your feedback. No, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. And so on, on the consistency side, you know, here's what it's not. It's a couple experiences that like I've had in the past, um, where like I walked in and I laid a client through what Highbridge did. You know, we're fundamental and we're quantitative, and we use both of those perspectives across all of our investment strategies. And like for example, within the long short space, you know, we use a lot of quantitative portfolio construction tools. Great pitch, right? I'm just crushing it. And then the PM walks in, and with me still in the room. The you know like investor asks him so like how do you use these quantitative tools? He goes well, I mean I don't really use them. I you know like I get the reports and the reports are great. They have nice charts, but you know it's not really part of my process. At that point, it's just a done meeting, you know, because this client thinks that they're getting one thing, and then they're getting something else, and they're not really sure what they're getting now. And if you just had me in there, fine. If you just had the PM, fine. But that's never how the sale happens. It's always you know me and the PM and the back office and the founder, and you know, I think Mark, like you made this point before, that that the investors don't always know exactly what they're looking for, but they know what's inconsistent. And if they hear different people saying different things, it's like this place just doesn't have their story straight, and so they must not have what they're doing straight. And um, you know, I mean, I've got a few stories like that, and then we finally said, okay, let's get everyone in the room. You know, let's have have the PMs all sit down and walk through the decks with them. And it took a few months just to like get these guys to do it because you know it's kind of a waste of time from like their perspective because they walk in they do their thing and they walk out 
and they don't see the damage afterwards. But that's crucial to just walk through the decks. Okay, here's what I'm going to say on this slide. Here's what you're going to say on this slide. Yeah, that's actually key, right? Just to stress it, the coordination, meaning that the client quoting, uh, the, the client doesn't know a lot of times what they want, but if they hear different bells, then they will resonate negatively, right? So I don't know if you guys have experienced that yourselves. Uh, this is very true. I mean, like we see that kind of preparation a lot in our firm as well. So maybe then we can expand on the uh, second point that is transparency. Uh, you know, your cut on that. Uh, maybe Mark, what would you? Are, are there any vendors out here who um, service the hedge fund or the uh, alternatives or even the long only uh, industry with, with an analytics or processes? And what product is that? A data mining package. Okay. And, and um, what other, any other products? Yeah. Bara. Bara and? Oh, hey. <laughs> NAG library. NAG library. Okay. So you have uh, the NAG library and you have um, the module is a data mining module. So that feeds into the investor analytics. You know, to me, um, that's something, if I was an investor, I'd want to know if the treasurer counterparty person is also using the data mining. So it, for all of the, from a transparency standpoint, I'm sort of staying back to the consistency message. And from your, I'm trying to help you sell here, right? You're, you guys paid. From an investor standpoint, you, you want to make sure that you're leveraging your product across the entire platform. And where does that help? You can say investors want to know that their dollars are being utilized on a data mining, not just for the um, healthcare PM, but for the people in operation for treasury, you know, treasury management or risk management. I want data mining, absolutely. So maybe that's something that you can use as a tool to get the sale to show that investors want to know that it's, it's, it's leverageable. Um, you, know, it's, you might think it's a stretch, but I'll tell you right now, if only way to, I'm in the risk consultancy business, the only way you're getting sales is if you can show that there's leverage to your product. Um, and that's something that I think does matter. Um, as far as uh, the next level going to transparency, Again, it, it is, there's a battle. I think Jeff mentioned it or maybe Atilio. Um, there's Opera. If you don't know what that is, I think um, it's something that is um, the Open Protocol uh, sponsored by Alborn. It's, it is a big animal. It's getting more adoption. It's something worth understanding whether they are the end user that survives this, this what do you want to call it? Um, uh, it's a land grab, I guess. A land grab, that's the word. It's kind of who can provide the analytics to the end investors. It's this you know, massive market where these state pension plans are willing to spend you know, 50K, 100 grand a year. And like every single one of them wants the industry standard. But there's no industry standard yet. Right? So, like, you know, so like open protocol is like one way that you can aggregate your data and you can give your end investors a, um, a perspective into your risk taking that they can then aggregate with all their other managers. And that's important for them which, you know, I mean, that's like one of the questions on the transparency side is how much are you going to give? But, but I think actually more, more, um, more like impactful is how you're going to give it. Because you can say, look, like we'll give full position transparency. Like you walk in, you can see our books and records, and the consultants go, you know, the consultants, the like end investors go, that's great, but then how do I use that information? Right? I can see it once, but then how do I aggregate that across all of my different managers? And so they actually want less information but in a more packaged format that they can share and so that's opera that's you know there's maybe five or six of these right now. uh novus is another one um hedgemark's you know, trying i think hedgemark uh measure risk i think has has a product uh i think like Barra has has a product through risk metrics i believe and, uh, so so can we drill a little bit further into the the the, the what to to release you know like clients versus prospects and uh and also, you know, you said it, there was basically, I don't want to misquote you, like I, my perception was like basically there's no uh, problem releasing like the most detailed information. Do you see problems that re delivering the most detailed information or would you, because you know, there's some conflicts. You don't want to release all your trades and, and, and everything that is happening. So, you know, clients versus prospects and you know, the detail, the depth of the. Sure, so, you know, with, you know, I, I think that the biggest constraint is that you have to assume that like anything that you put on paper and that you let a prospect walk out with is going to be seen by one of your competitors. I mean, it's, you know, like whether it's a fund of funds who talks with other managers or state pension plan who also talks with managers, you know, it's, 
it's kind of this, you know, like I don't want my competitors to find out, but I have to tell prospects. So do I just, you know, say things verbally? Okay, that's great, but they want to actually go back and like run some analytics on it. So I have to give them my returns. But you have to give them risk reports and things like that. Like we found that that should happen farther down in, in the process, you know, that there's kind of a vetting process. And then in the third or fourth stage meeting, that's when you say, okay, here's, here's the kimono. But, you know, that stuff will make it out into the, into the public domain. So you have to protect your strategies and you have to protect your firm because you don't want someone being able to look at what you give out and say, uh, yeah, okay, see. so I can hire these three guys from that firm and that's all their alpha? Great. Kind of best practice on lagging information maybe or something like that. Like, you know, you release all the detail, you know, maybe three months prior or any kind of cut on that? Or? I think this goes to perspective now, right? Go ahead. I think that's, uh, that's right. So, sorry. Third point. Point number one was uh, internal consistency. Point number two is transparency. Point number three is perspective. Now getting to the perspective. Yeah, right? and this is the part where hopefully your firm has a consistent message that's a core that you can sort of um, pivot off of to, to, to meet the, man, uh, the, the demands of a regulator, of a counterparty, because they want to know what you're doing, uh, or an investor. So that, that's your core, and you've, and you've worked it out, as Jeff said, internally about how to communicate it. And then there's a the medium, which you exchange, and that's going to be a fight a food fight over raw data versus finished product and timing when they get it, right? You want to be able to have that counterparty investor um, be a partner with you so that they're not as interested in giving away that currency of information. Because that's what I look at is it's currency for them. They're smarter because they came to see you. Now, are they going to use that for their full betterment without any, any judgment on how it impacts the relationship or your firm? The closer you are, the longer it takes for them to get that information, hopefully, this could be um, uh, guileless of me, is hopefully um, they're more aligned with you over time and have your interests as well as their So you don't give it out right away. So you walk them up the path of transparency. And that's a, that's a discipline that goes back to the core of what you give and over what time frame. The, 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 the audience you're talking to is so disparate. And this is something I've said a couple times today. If we gave a test, and, and Krista, um, a, a fellow singer right here, I know. Um, if, if, if you gave a test to all of us, I know I'd fail part of it because you're deeper in verticals than I am. And everyone in this room has different disciplines. Jeff has a different background than mine than Natilio. Same thing with the investor audience. So to, to give a standard to them is going to be useless. So how to speak investor ease, we're staying with that. It's a core. You have to choose what they're going to give you in the transmission mechanism. But the art, there's a little bit of art in this relationship, is find out what that little part is that they want to know. And what do you, I, I think it's only at the very end uh, that you give that part, right? Everything else is sort of standardized. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to figure out like, what they really want. And, and I think it actually does differ systematically by, by the different investor bases. I mean, I think of the folks that have you know, 30, 40 hedge fund investments. I think that they're really trying to figure out how this new marginal thing fits into their portfolio. And so for that, it's about how much risk this is going to contribute at the margin. So it's, you know, how much beta is it running? Is it beta to equities, to credit, to rates? You know, is it going to be a hedge against the rest of my portfolio? Um, is it actually a diversifying source of alpha? So like even if it's neutral to market factors, you know, in the CTA space, is it highly correlated or is it less correlated? And I think that's more kind of the large hedge fund portfolios where like these guys have been doing this you know for 10 or 20 years on say the high net worth space or smaller you know like smaller pension plans that are just getting into the game it's much more about just you know who has alpha because if i'm just going to get three hedge funds that, then i want the person who has the most alpha but you still go through that same exercise of trying to decompose the performance and just because someone looked good for the last five years how do i know that's going to be there going forward and it's, it's like an analytical suite that, that like they have to do for that. So, but if I hear on the granularity, if I hear you, correct me if I'm mishearing you, is the, the message is, well, you know, it doesn't really matter to drill down into what trades or what not. In reality, what matters is the aggregate figure, say risk-adjusted figure, and the correlation with whatever the client or prospect has. So kind of know the client, know what he or she has, and then explain how you can diversify in terms of risk and in terms of like expected return. Is that more or less? Yeah, yeah I think that's right. I mean, like we've had clients who, who have asked us for the full, you know, like show us every position. But I think that's more so they can tell their investors. 
you know, like whether it's a private bank or a fund of funds, so they can say, yes, we've seen every position in the book. Now, what their client should say is, yeah, but like, how do you use that? It's, you know, like 5,000 positions for the high bridge multi strat. Like, okay, so you've seen all the positions, but what are the exposures? And so that's, I think, the more important piece of it. And in terms of like stepping just back a second on, on something that was mentioned by both of you guys, the Opera framework, I like to pick on the audience a little bit. Like, for instance, <laughs> some representative from a major vendor, Jose Minchero. What, what's what's the cut on you know like this kind of Opera standard coming up, and uh, how do you? You don't need to speak for your firm, but just your perspective. Krista, just, uh, it's just a framework, but uh, how do you feel about like having a framework that is external, kind of certified versus, versus private vendors in some sense? Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'll pass on that, Atilio, because oh, I... Sorry. No. <laughs> well, I mean, like BARA, I think actually, you know, is, is a standard across the industry for the equity space, where you can say, you know, look, I'm not going to show you all my positions, and you can ask me my beta, but you know you probably want more detail than that. Here's uh, you know like bar output. Here's what my factor exposures are. Here's a performance attribution where I can decompose my returns. And so you can get some sense of whether you know I say that I'm a sector timer and a style timer, but if all my returns have been from country, then you know it's back on the consistency point. I think like using bar for that is fantastic, but that's in the equity space. As soon as you're you know in the CTA space, in the credit space, then I don't think there's as much of a single answer that that has that has like been established yet yeah. yeah also because the the oh we only have 10 minutes yeah also because the the cta space what really matters is the dynamic of the strategy not really the single spot position so you know you might be if you have a strategy that rebalances every every day then you don't care about the snapshot you right. care about the behavior so that one you don't capture with the you know vendor position just the snapshot so that you cannot get so, uh, you know, here you have up here, you have uh, Jeff's been, you know, C CRO of a pretty large, unique platform, hedge fund on a big bank, uh, academic before that, and a couple different platforms. I've been on two or three different um, platforms, mostly credit-based, but also long, short equity, and we've, and we've lived before and after this pretty impressive crisis. Um, if I was going to put out two or three scenarios for you guys to want to hear, one is, how do we prepare it internally? What's it life like to be a chief risk officer in a firm and interfacing with a client? Do you want specific stories from us? The next one is, is there utility in any of this? And as I think Jeff might have mentioned in some of our emails, do people just say, I need long, short exposure because that's where I think the returns are? How, you know, do you want to know what, what we see in the investor side? Um, and then conversely, do you want it to talk about the players? In the, in the marketplace, like uh, the investor analytics people um, versus are the banks in, you know, involved, uh, the prime brokers? Do you want to know about the players? I mean, I'm, we, we can talk about anything up here. I'll tell you my preference, but it, I'll wait for a hand to raise. And if there aren't any, I'll give you my preference. My preference is that to talk about or to tell you that I think on the risk side at a firm, and, and Jeff intimated earlier, there is so much information left on a cutting room floor that is produced by the risk group that is not taken up by the investors because there isn't a consistent way for them to take it up. It's just starting now a little bit. And the investment side only wants to know a base level, sort of a barrier. Like, and, that's, and that's fine, meaning do we have enough capital to run our business? Is liquidity there? Fine. Next. So I, I think investors are now starting to ping the risk side more yeah. and more. And that's that's a migration happening. So if you're a vendor, if you're anyone in the business, that's what I think is happening. Does it mean we get different people in our roles, or we get bigger staffs, or we get, uh, you know, we work, work more with marketing? I don't know. But the currency that we have that I think is left and has been underutilized, internally it's being picked up a little bit. Externally it is in big demand. And that's a, that's a difference on how that impacts your businesses, but that's a dynamic that is, I think, last two, three years evolving. So yeah, that's your perception of the evolution of yeah. this. Uh, and, and yeah, yeah, I think that's true, especially a kind of a large multi-manager firm. Because I can come in as an end investor and meet with each of the PMs, you know, for half an hour. But you got 15 or 20 PMs who I would have to speak with just to get the perspective of like what this firm does across, 
across like all of the different asset classes and approaches. You know, okay, so I can spend you know seven or eight hours, or I can talk with the risk guy for one hour, and I, I can kind of get this much across all the strategies. And I think that like investors really are starting to see that. And you know, like sometimes I'm actually in in in, in like that first meeting now, and it's you know it creates a tension though because you have to manage risk. I mean, <laughs> chief risk officer, not chief marketing officer, and so there's this you know the constant squabble between the marketing folks and the risk people saying like I'll take that one, I won't take that one, and it's. But that's the idea of the consistency a little bit, right? Versus mm -hmm. transparency and kind of convergence of these two versus, right? Yeah, I, I got a, a story about that. So good news is if you've been in enough places, you can talk about a story and not implicate one fund versus another. So I was at one firm and uh, an investor said, so your leverage is only, or is three times. And they said, that's great. That's, um, that is uh, three times, you know, based on your capital and exposure. And I said, well, no, no, actually the principals use um, uh, net over gross as, as kind of the, le the uh, leverage number. So they use, they don't use equity capital um, as the, as the uh, denominator. And they had a different, uh, uh, they had a number that basically allowed their net limit to be based on gross, not capital. So if you were running, it, it, was, it was net. So your net exposure was limited to 10%, not a capital, but a gross. So the more leverage you apply, the bigger your net could be. You'd be running, you know, 80% net long on capital and only, it was 30%, and then 30% net long on, on, on gross. Um, this was something that investors for four years didn't understand. Now, running at odds, when asked, I understood it, we explained it, and the investor pulled money. So there's a, there's a, uh, this is why the investors are going to risk people, because the risk people, you know, like what's that movie, uh, Ella Can't Tell a Lie, the old movie, where she had to say yes to everything? My kids watched it about a year ago, so Ella Enchanted. So she had to say yes to everything. So as a risk manager, you're, you're bound, but they ask you a question on leverage, and it's, it's in the document. They're just basically looking for the footnote. They found it. They knew where to go. Right. So we have no guile, right? So right. You know, I've had like marketing people just kick me under the table. Like you, you just can't tell people that. Yeah. But, yeah, but it's true though, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's not what I've told them for the last four years. It's like, you know, it's kind of a turnover process on here's what the story used to be, which was fine for certain audiences, um, you know, but here's how it actually is now. And, and like that process is very, very painful, but and some investors didn't care about the, the uh, differing, you know, the uh, uh, definition of leverage. So it, that's just a, that's a dynamic that's going on. And, and regulation and transparency of footnote and process is all, there's a lot of factors. Like the compliance officer says, you have to explain everything. So now it's written down. So now it's kind of out there. It wasn't out there before. Yeah. And then, you know, we're here um, uh, acting to verify information for investors. So bigger resource. And again, that goes back to control. Is everyone here? Maybe that message should come from the CIOs, not the risk people. And that's, you know, that first peg of what we talked about of the control is very important. Um, so you can capture a message and, and transmit it through the second layer so that it's received in, in, the, in the manner you want to as a firm. Yes, that's about all the time we have. We have maybe time for one, uh, one comment. If you have a comment, otherwise we can move on to the next. Are we moving on? Oh, there's one comment from Marat. I can see why Tilio is the MC here. He <laughs> kind of got his name everybody. in his pocket. Uh, actually, I have a question for you. Uh, do you ever ask by investors about allocation of risk, whether you're taking the type of risk that you'll reward? Do you question a lot about those things? No. If you're asked about the allocation of risk? Yeah, that's right. Whether you're taking the type of risk that you'll reward, do you get questioned as chief risk officer or not? Well, yeah, it's definitely my case. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, now, part of the answer, though, is, you know, because we have a multi-strategy fund, uh, fund, and so that's it's kind of a natural question there. You know, like, okay, so you have six different strategies, and, like, how are you allocated, and how do you make that decision? Um, but like, even within some of our single strategy funds, we get that same question. It's that I'm not typically answering it. 
it's that the PM answers it. So like for our long short fund, how are you allocated across you know, your 15 different ideas and how do you think about that? That's something that, that the portfolio manager handles. Yeah, in, in our case, it's very similar. We have a, have a two-way process. There's a systematic kind of uh, fully non-discretionary approach within strategy and then there is the allocation across strategies and the allocation across strategies is based on views on risk, so yes. Oh, Jose. Thank you. So um, if you're building a portfolio and you have, say, multiple strategies, uh, each portfolio manager might be making certain investment decisions that sort of optimize their section of the portfolio, but viewed from the level of all the different asset classes you're invested in, for example, um, you know, it, those might not be the optimal positions when you combine them into the rest of the portfolio. So do you sometimes use overlay strategies to you know, correct for those kind of imbalances, or how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, like we do for for the, for the multi-strat, um, where we're trying to control kind of the left tail correlation, where you know all of the factors correlate, and then your alpha also seems to correlate as well. Like, you know, like it acts like alpha until there's this extreme left tail, and then it might not be alpha. Um, and so we do some overlays there. I think also investors have started looking at that same question for their portfolios, and so that's you know the prevalence of you know, like tail risk funds, um, you know, like 40, 50 billion in them now across the entire industry. The performance has been awful for the last three or four years because we haven't actually had the tails. But, it, you know, I mean, that's basically investors trying to do that same thing, trying to protect their portfolios from the same types of left tail events, which, which, which can come up from, you know, I mean, like you said, each of, um, each of the managers building a portfolio that's great for that manager, but then you aggregate those across the whole portfolio. And if you've got, you know, like 30 different hedge funds in your portfolio, you probably have a lot of hedge fund beta. Yeah, a little, little just to, to uh, so emphasize that, that answer. So there's also different different ways to interact. Like there's one the strategy, the, the overlapping of different strategies, there isn't something more simple that is the netting of trades. And that one is easily taken into account at the centralized at the trading desk. So that's not a, it's a no-brainer. But yeah, when you are in the business of like overemphasizing one strategy over the other one, there's a level of subjectivity in that one. But okay, so I guess uh, that's it. And uh, thank you very much. We thank the panel. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.